I'm really excited to introduce a research scientist at Google. He's actually a friend of Snorkel's and has given uh, talks with us before. If you're interested, you can look him up uh, at, on the Snorkel blog and you'll see a talk that he gave on measuring NLP progress. But today, I'm really excited to welcome him to talk about scaling NLP to the next thousand languages. Please join me in welcoming research scientist at Google, Sebastian Ruder. Sebastian, great to have you here. Thanks so much for the intro and thanks so much for, for having me. I'm super excited to talk to you today. Um, cool, all right, let me share my presentation. Um, so as Piyush already mentioned, I have the pleasure to talk to you today about the challenges and opportunities um, as it comes to broadening access to NLP technology and um, developing NLP technology for most or large number of the world's languages. Um, one issue that is um, at the heart of my talk today is um, regards um, the issue of language diversity in natural language processing research. And the main question that I want you to ask yourself throughout this talk is how we can um, generally make natural language processing um, technology more accessible and useful to the speakers of the thousand most frequently spoken languages. And even though thousand languages sounds like a very large number, um, we, we were far not talking about small speaker locations here. So looking at the top most frequently spoken languages of the world, um, for the top 400 um, most frequently spoken languages, each of these has more than 1 million speakers among them. And looking at the top 1,200 languages, each still has more than 100,000 speakers. So these are really large numbers of speakers and large numbers of users that we're currently not adequately serving with our existing technology. Because as it is, um, the current state in natural language processing research is uh, still um, similar to about 10 years ago, um, that most um, current research approaches and technology is still being developed um, only for English. Um, at the same time, however, there's a, a positive um, silver lining here. Um, in that, there's been an increasing amount of work on developing multilingual models. And current multilingual models cover around 100 um, languages in their pre-trained data. Um, so looking a bit more closely at recent progress in multilingual modeling, um, we can kind of get a glimpse of that progress if we look at a standard benchmark um, for cross-lingual multilingual learning in NLP. Um, which is called Extreme. Um, and this benchmark you can kind of see as the multilingual analog to a benchmark you might be familiar with, which is Clue, um, which has been uh, credited with catalyzing a lot of progress um, in developing large language models by enabling evaluation on a large set of different tasks. And similarly here, this benchmark um, evaluates what, how well different models generalize to um, about 40 different languages on a set of nine different tasks. And looking here at kind of the first generation of um, large multilingual models about two years ago to um, the most recent models um, this year, we can see that there's been um, a steady and quite significant progress and that the scores have been continually edging uh, closer and closer towards human level performance. Um, however, one thing that this score and looking at this very positive picture um, obfuscates is that um, most of the current tasks we have available for evaluating the performance of our models um, only cover a very small set of languages. So if we look at the matrix of uh, tasks at the top here and um, languages at, as rows, um, we can see here that most tasks only cover comparatively small set of languages indicated by the green cells here. And that most um, languages actually still uncovered by most existing tasks that we currently have available for measuring and tracking progress um, in terms of developing these multilingual models. Um, and the problem is even worse if we look at the languages where we're doing most poorly on, which are the languages with comparatively little amount of resources, um, as measured here in the number of um, documents that are available for them in Wikipedia. Um, so if we only look at languages that currently uh, do not have much pre-trained data available, um, we see that most of these languages are not included at all in existing, um, in kind of a diverse set of existing tasks. Um, now looking at the other picture on the modeling side, um, and we can kind of um, roughly uh, categorize recent models that were developed in NLP um, based on the fraction 
of non-English pre-trained data that we use. So if we kind of plot all these recent models um, based on the amount of multilingual data that they were pre-trained on, um, we can kind of expectantly see um, these multilingual models that I already mentioned um, being right at the top. So um, most of these models have a comparatively small fraction of English data and, and um, a large number of other languages being represented in pre-training. Um, however, at the same time, um, what is arguably still the mainstream of current research in natural language processing um, still uh, mostly trains on English models. So that is from kind of the original BERT model all the way to models like GPT-3 and recent models like Palm, which are very large language models developed by Google. Uh, most of these models are still very much English-centric and have seen comparatively small amounts of multilingual data. Um, so also for the remainder of the talk, I think um, I want us to think about how in the future and as a community, I think it will be very important to try to have these two streams converge and not try to develop just models for English and models for all other languages, but ultimately um, aiming to serve with a single model um, most of the um, most spoken languages of the world. Um, and for that, um, the in order to really scale to these next thousand languages. There's kind of two aspects I want to talk about. Um, first, on the modeling side, um, where I think we need more efficient models and models that are inherently multimodal. And on the data side, where we need benchmarks that more accurately reflect the scenarios and settings of um, users and of downstream settings. And where we also need to take into account language varieties. Um, so what does that mean specifically? Um, firstly, looking at computation efficiency. In practice, um, if we're doing NLP um, for in the multilingual setting, we typically talk about these languages or the general research setting about low resource NLP, meaning that we want to apply our methods to uh, languages and settings that have um, typically limited amounts of training data available. Um, however, in practice, the settings where these underrepresented languages are spoken um, also defined by constraints that go beyond just the um, lack of data and um, that uh, go to com that involve uh, limitations on compute. Um, for instance, uh, mobile data is much more expensive in uh, many countries where underrepresented languages are spoken. Um, and similarly, other resources that we have come to depend on, like TPUs or GPUs, might be uh, much more unavailable or completely inaccessible in many of these settings that we actually want to apply our mod models to. Um, so while we could kind of continue to scale up um, the size of our models and try to cover um, as many languages as we can with 500 billion, ultimately trillion parameter models, um, these huge models will not really be practically useful or practically feasible to deploy for many of these languages. Um, so in order to really make tangible and uh, progress and impact for these languages, we really need to think about how we can also develop uh, models that are efficient at the same time, not only in terms of um, only requiring uh, limited amounts of data or small amounts of data to learn very good and robust representations, but also in terms of the, uh, their requirements on compute, in terms of the space that they require and their latency during training or inference. And on that note, I just want to highlight here a couple of uh, what I think are useful directions along those three different dimensions. Firstly, on the sample efficiency side, I think as a um, community, both natural language processing and machine learning, we have um, come to learn what Rich Sutton has called this bitter lesson um, that for most problems that we are uh, facing these days, um, just scaling up our models and training on much more data. So just developing models that can very easily scale um, to more, um, more parameters, more data is really the silver bullet and approach that continues uh, bringing new gains. Um, however, in practice, um, for really scaling and developing models for these um, low resource underrepresented languages, um, we simply do not have access to um, huge amounts of data um, available in practice. And we likely won't ever be able to get huge, of, uh, huge amounts of data to really um, reap the benefits uh, from this better lesson from really scaling up um, our models to their capacity. Um, so in turn, 
for um, developing and for research along those directions. I think actually looking back more towards the roots and actually looking to encode inductive biases will become more, more useful and influential. And, and these inductive biases in language here uh, can take inspiration from linguistics. So for many of these languages, um, they're quite different from, from English and other languages that we are used to, um, which leads to weaknesses. Um, uh, of the models that we are using at the moment. So if you look at the segmentation of the tokenization um, by state-of-the-art multilingual models like XMR on some very common words in different languages, you can see here that um, the model actually um, under segments. So it doesn't split um, certain words in languages um, that are overrepresented in training, like English, uh, for the English word excitement, it just assigns a single token, while words in other languages, even very high resource ones, are um, proportionally oversegmented, split into many more tokens that we would actually expect from a morphological perspective. Um, so there are many opportunities here to actually encode more knowledge about what um, the uh, structure and the linguistics characteristics are of those languages. On the space side, there's also um, I think opportunity to move away from our current like monolithic approaches and kind of monolithically fine tuning a huge model for a downstream setting and actually being much more modular and nimble in terms of how we can encode and enable capacity for different settings like different languages here. And this can, for instance, take the shape of um, using expert modules in the form of adapters or even subnetwork uh, networks that have been identified through lottery tickets in our existing models and only adapting or fine tuning those for specific target settings. Um, and finally, on the time efficiency side, we also have opportunities to actually rethink the uh, parameter allocation and how we tokenize our models from the ground up to better serve um, the properties and the settings of these uh, underrepresented languages. Now on the um, multimodal side in terms of modeling, um, currently we are training our models on huge amounts of unlabeled data, um, typically from Wikipedia or from data that is available on the web. Um, but as we look towards scaling these models to the next thousand languages, um, this amount of text data on the web is simply not available or very, very hard to access in, uh, in practice. And this, so this requires actually being able to train and learn representations for these languages requires looking at alternative data sources. Um, because most of these languages are actually not um, resource poor in that um, they don't have any resource available, um, but just the resources and data that is available for them is just available in formats that we currently are not accessing or that are not easily machine readable at the moment. Um, so that can be in large amounts of literature, that is in handwritten documents or books that simply haven't been digitized yet, in linguistic lexicons that linguists have been creating through field work and uh, field studies, or in uh, radio podcasts and uh, radio uh, by radio state, local radio stations, um, or just through the large variety and diversity of videos um, on different video platforms like YouTube. Um, and in addition, um, many um, of these next thousand languages are also much more commonly spoken than written, um, either because these languages have um, like a standard topography or don't really have a written tradition. Um, so actually dealing um, using speech data for those languages is a much better fit also to serve the um, settings and the requirements of the users in practice. And on those, uh, so in general, in order to really make progress um, in those directions, we really need to develop models that are not only multilingual, uh, but also inherently multimodal, and that are able to leverage data that comes not only from text that is available on the internet, but from a wide variety of different sources. Um, We've, we're currently already making progress towards some of these directions. Um, for instance, recent models have already been starting to be trained uh, in a multimodal setting, both using text and speech data. Um, like you can see here, recent uh, multimodal speech and text models that are pre-trained on uh, unlabeled data from speech and text data sets, as well as labeled data from existing ASR data sets, and then combining those with different text and speech specific pre-training um, objectives. Um, in addition to support the development of these new models, we also need um, benchmarks that take into account this multimodality, um, such as including different um, multimodal speech-focused tasks as well, as well as text-focused tasks that have a speech component, um, like speech-based question answering. Um, now looking at the data side, in order to really um, make a difference and be able to um, 
serve the, the settings and serve users in those uh, local settings. Uh, really need to develop data sets that are reflective on the um, of the local circumstances. And one downside of the existing data sets is that many of them um, have been created using translation, um, just because that is typically the most e uh, the easiest way um, to create new data in another language. Um, uh, because eliciting or annotating an entirely new data set from scratch is typically much more expensive. Um, however, as is well known in linguistic circles, um, translation needs differs in many subtle and not so subtle aspects from uh, natural language. Um, in addition, the, um, by using uh, translation to simply translate existing data sets to other languages, um, we're also incorporating a bias in those languages, and specifically um, a bias towards uh, the viewpoints and perspectives that are encoded by the data that we're translating, which has been typically collected um, using uh, crowd contributors based in the US, um, which uh, typically have a more Western-centric viewpoint. And we can see that, for instance, by looking at the coverage of different entities from different nationalities in current uh, question answering data sets, where we can see a large um, number or large fraction of these um, entities being uh, associated with the US or uh, the uh, UK, uh, so English speaking countries. Um, so in order to really um, serve and develop models that are actually practically useful um, for speakers of these languages, we also need to develop data sets that are both practically relevant um, as well as challenging for evaluating in these underrepresented languages, such as um, de uh, developing multimodal data sets for image captioning that represent data set, uh, rep uh, that contain images um, um, that capture uh, locally relevant concepts, like in this example from a recent data set from last year. Um, in order to move towards that goal, um, we need to work closely with local speaker communities because in practice, um, annotators for most of these uh, next thousand languages are simply not available on existing cross-sourcing platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, so we really need to get in touch and work closely with the people who actually, and the communities who actually speak those languages. And uh, that involves not just uh, um, working with them on annotating the data, but actually involving them on the cycle of um, data development from the task conception uh, through the data annotation and model development to ensure that the data actually reflects and is relevant for their local context. And in order to really scale this up, um, we also need to develop more efficient means to actually um, work with them to elicit and annotate data. And given the capabilities of large scale language models, um, I think there's a whole range of approaches um, using models of humans in the loop or models uh, in collaboration with humans um, that is, we, we can still, or that is still currently untapped. And we are only at the moment just scratching the surface of that. And you can kind of see here on the right, a figure from a recent data set where uh, models together with humans have been uh, collaborating in terms of extending an existing data set to new, more challenging cases. On the last note, um, in order to um, serve all these 6,000 languages, we also have to move away from this um, monolithic and rigid definition of what actually a language constitutes. Uh, so there's a famous quote where a language is solely um, uh, basically simply dialect with an army and a navy. So what uh, um, typically is defined as language really differs based on the um, sociolinguistic and political um, circumstances. And in fact, many um, language varieties um, that are um, in many countries like China are actually as important as in digital languages. So different varieties of Chinese or even Brazilian Portuguese, which is still at the moment treated as a single Chinese language or a single um, Portuguese language in most applications. Um, so in order to really develop applications that are useful for speakers, we need to take into account those dialects, including the lexical variation among them. And we must develop systems that can actually um, serve people not only in the language that they speak, but also in the language variety or the particular dialect that they most prefer and uh, speaking and that is most useful to them. And here, simply uh, in terms of uh, initial steps to that, we can um, we should augment our data sets by providing a dialect and other linguistic metadata. So um, being able to actually tell that our models perform well on a certain dialect or a certain register of language. 
Um, and we should start um, developing and evaluating our models um, and training them to be robust to different language varieties, not only for prediction, um, like you can see here for language identification, um, but also towards generating data in different language varieties, for instance, for machine translation. Um, so with that, I just want to um, end here again by emphasizing uh, these four different aspects that I mentioned as kind of, I think, four key requirements and tenets that I think are necessary to make um, sustainable and impactful progress towards um, scaling natural language processing to the next thousand languages. Um, thanks so much for, for listening to the talk. That was a fantastic presentation. Thanks so much for organizing it in such a kind of easy to follow format with these four buckets and then also for sharing your thoughts. We do have quite a few questions rolling in. So, you know, we'd love to kind of, you know, get your, your take on some of these. So let's start with one coming from Brayden. Said, this sounds like a really difficult problem in so many ways. One that's gonna go require a whole community to solve. Who else, individuals or organizations, do you see as leaders in the space whose work you'd recommend? Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's a great question. And yeah, and I think you, you've definitely identified like one of the key points is some, it's not something like a, a single individual, a single group or a single organization even can do. I think this really requires um, systemic efforts on the on entire community level and also really requires the interdisciplinary work in terms of working with uh, linguists, with communities, with ethicists as well in terms of the responsible um, usage and development of these technologies. And um, I think also great, great uh, ongoing current efforts in this line of work are, for instance, um, kind of very large collaborative efforts. Um, so things like the Big Science Workshop, uh, which was kind of a large um, decentralized collaboration of NLP researchers across many different countries, uh, which culminated uh, quite recently into the, into the development of uh, Bloom, an uh, openly accessible large scale language model that already covers, I think, 50 uh, languages. And I think that is kind of a very nice uh, kind of example or prototype about the kind of level of um, uh, level of uh, collaboration on an organization something like this, uh, like this might require. Um, and I think similar, similar efforts um, more on kind of a local level are uh, done by um, communities working specifically on progressing work in different languages. Uh, so different language communities, there's uh, kind of different communities for Arabic NLP, for instance, or um, increasingly very active communities working on African languages. And there's been a lot of um, effort and also workshops like the African NLP workshop at ICLEAR being organized by those communities. Um, so I think kind of both uh, like on different levels of granularity from, from communities as well as organizations is really, uh, really necessary and important here. And it's really great. I'm personally really excited to see um, a lot of progress recently in different directions here. That's awesome. Speaking of kind of the language varieties and, you know, I think there's a few questions specifically there. So Peter is asking, do you find the pre-training objective needs to change given the semantics of some language families? like uh, agglo-native languages like Hungarian. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, I think so, um, so far, um, um, so I think the, in terms of pre-training objectives, I'm very much of the opinion um, regarding what I mentioned uh, for in, uh, in terms of the importance of uh, incorporating interactive biases. And I think uh, designing more language um, specific or more targeted pre-training objectives is one way to kind of encode these assumptions or uh, prior knowledge about um, what is useful to, to learn about or how to like segment or uh, what to predict in different languages. Um, so far, I um, most of the kind of work on these inductive biases, I think, has been more on the um, segmentation side. So basically developing more, um, say, morphologically informed um, tokenization methods that take into account, say, a morphological analyzer to construct subwords that take into account these uh, like morphology or the different morphemes in agglutinative languages, like you mentioned. Um, but I could also see doing kind of trying to do similar things for um, in the pre-training objectives where we've also already seen in the past kind of a move away from um, kind of the, more, the very generic um, setting of just predicting individual subwords um, where people have found it's more useful to actually predict uh, entire uh, whole words and as like contiguous sequences. Um, so I can see um, like future work actually looking at different uh, like masking different morphemes or different uh, like parts of like longer, longer words, um, for instance. Um, and similarly, um, for other languages, like in 
many African languages, um, you have tone that is lexified through the use of diacritics. Um, so you could also have that, those, uh, and that is currently a lot of um, pre-processing currently strips out these diacritics, uh, assuming that they don't really um, have any meaning, which, which they do for many languages. Um, so also being kind of more aware of just these language specific um, details and incorporating differentiation of them into pre-training, I think could be very useful. Very, very related to the, exactly what you're just talking about, where, you know, so many kind of uh, languages might have characters that might also mean the same thing. There's a question from Madeline saying, for languages like Japanese, where characters can mean various things, like, can the large language model still distinguish, you know, well? And is the, how does the performance compare to English words with multiple meanings? Um, yeah, yeah, I think that, that that's a great a great point. And yeah, particular languages like yeah, Japanese, uh, Chinese, or Korean, um, I think have have been mostly served. I think there's been a lot of um, uh, like communities of work specifically targeting um, some of those languages. And um, while I think more of the like general language modeling work has been, I think, dominated by the assumptions just from like English, and that just using say support segmentation is uh, like sufficient um, for for these languages as well. And I think particularly for those languages, I find quite promising um, like models that directly take the symbols or individual characters as input and then learn how to kind of group them or like tokenize them in more of a soft manner. Um, and I think generally um, for these types of like large scale multilingual work, I think it's really, uh, we will see probably over time kind of moving away from these very like rigid or um, uh, supports which mostly work just for morphologically poor languages like English and towards more flexible representations of the input. That's awesome. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I see one from uh, Vashish here saying, what is your opinion on having a single monolithic model that shares knowledge across languages versus multiple smaller models per language family? Uh, yeah, a, a great question as well. Um, so I think in terms of like just research frontiers, I think it's obviously um, just important uh, to continue trying to scale our models up and seeing how well we can actually do um, with uh, larger models. And we've already seen by just simply scaling up these multilingual models by having more capacity in the for each language in these large models that we uh, continue to see gains as well. Although these gains are kind of more more limited for languages where we haven't seen a lot of related languages or uh, which are not represented a lot uh, during pre-training. Um, but at the same time, I think um, these large models are kind of interesting for like the scientific purpose, but quite uh, difficult to uh, to use or to really um, build on for, for future work. Um, so I think as a more uh, kind of efficient and more practical compromise, I think really having models that are maybe not specific for individual languages, but um, that cover um, a set of related languages, uh, like for instance, um, common languages from a language family or um, multiple kind of geographically related languages. Um, so relevant models here have been developed for say 10 or 15 different African languages. And there's also um, a number of models for Indian languages, for instance, where you can also, um, even though Indian languages have different uh, scripts uh, among them, um, many of these actually are like uh, phonemically or in terms of the, the speech uh, very similar. Um, so there's much more important, uh, much more information that can be shared by actually developing strategies in uh, kind of this related language or language family specific perspective. That's awesome. Well, Sebastian, thank you so much for, for answering a few questions here and for a great presentation. In the, in the chat, you're probably seeing some shout outs to your blog. So people are clearly you know, aware of your work and very, very appreciative. Uh, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me and thanks so much for the great questions. It was super, was really uh, exciting and it's great to be able to engage with all of you.